Greetings, everyone. My name is Dr. Richard Warren Jr. and I'm a part of the Teachers One-on-One -on -one team. My name is Rebecca Poe. I teach special education. I started my career as a K through second teacher, moved to middle school for a little while, realized there are special people in the world who are supposed to be middle school teachers. I am not one of them. So I am <laughs> going back to K2 this fall. Oh, that is awesome. How long have you been in the profession and, and what drew you to it? Okay, so I started my career in special education as a paraprofessional while I was working on my master's degree. So I have been in the special education world for 11 years and I'm starting my fifth year as the lead teacher in the classroom setting. What keeps you in the field? Like, what keeps you doing what you do every day? I don't feel done. You know, like it's, it's nothing really specific that I can put my finger on. I've always said, you know, I will, I will stay in a position until I feel like I'm finished with it, until I feel like I'm ready to move on to the next thing. And right now I still feel like this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be in the classroom for this next year and however many years after that. When planning for back to school, what is the number one thing that, uh, that is causing teacher anxiety? What do you think? It's the unknown. So especially this year, I'm changing schools. I'm changing grade levels. I don't know what to expect. I have seen the room. I've been able to be in there a little bit over the summer. I've seen the school, but it's just not knowing for sure what it's going to be like. And it doesn't matter if you've been teaching, you know, this is your first year. This is your 21st year. Each year is different and each year is unknown. Can you offer a few simple tips to kind of ease this anxiety? For me, what I like to do is because I'm a special education teacher, I try to get my hands on those IEPs as early as possible. I don't want to be going into the school year completely blind to what the students on my caseload are going to be looking like, what their goals are, their service minutes. So what I do is I'll look at their goals so I can start getting plans for what types of assessments am I going to need? What types of pre-assessments do I want to start with? What am I going to use for progress monitoring? Mm -hmm. So for this year, I've been able to look at the IEPs. I know I have several students who have goals to be able to decode CVC words. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to pull some resources for that so that when I do get to start working with those students, we're ready to hit the ground running and I'm not kind of having to play catch up with what they're going to need because I've already been able to look at it a little bit more. And the same can go for general education teachers. You, you know the scope and sequence of your curriculum. What do you wanna start with? What's that first lesson you wanna to touch on? Often it's just teaching expectations and building relationships for those first couple of weeks. Go ahead and start pulling your resources together for that, have them at your fingertips that way as soon as that first day and those kids come into the building and they're nervous and they're excited just like you are you know what your first day is going to look like if you had to prepare a classroom bulletin board in five steps or less oh what God. would they be <laughs> what would they be what are your hacks for that okay um so my trick for the simplest bulletin board ever use a flat twin size sheet to cover the bulletin board. That way, you know, it's not paper, it's not getting ripped. You can take it down, put it up, wash it if you need to. So start with that, get your material, get that put up. And the next one, you're going to get um, strips and scraps of like colorful cardstock. That's what you're gonna use to kind of put at the top, you know, make it kind of confetti-ish going across. It's always fun. The colors, you know, you it doesn't have to be perfect. You can mix, mix and match whatever you wanna do. Then for the words, unbelievable work, or our work is awesome, something related to student work. And then use those same colorful pieces of paper, stick those in rows on that bulletin board and slap a piece of paper on it says, awesome work coming soon. And that's what you're gonna use to display student work. It's a complete bulletin board. It's completely ready to go, but you're able to change it up as you get the students in the classroom to show off what they've been working on. It lets them take a little bit of ownership for the classroom decorations because they see part of themselves up on the wall. They know this is their space and they know they can be excited about it because they contributed to it. What are three necessities that no classroom should be without? Practically in the classroom, getting ready for those first few days, I would like to start with dry erase markers, dry erase boards, and erasers. If, if you give me those three things, I can teach 
any subject, any lesson. Yeah. We're going to use those dry erase boards to write on. We've got, you know, if you don't have an eraser, you can use part of a washcloth. I like to get the little baby socks from the Dollar Tree. They're a little bitty. You erase with them, put mm-hmm. them in the laundry, wash them. They're, they come back clean the next day. Getting socks as a household item. I know like a lot of teachers are, you know, trying to wrap their minds or mind around like going to the market or going to the store and mm-hmm. buying items and, you know, all the different things that teachers do. Um, to make sure that the classrooms is, are set up well. Right. But some of the things like you alluded to, like even socks, like are some, yeah. <laughs> are, are some like things that you already have in your mm-hmm. house that you can like utilize in the classroom. So exactly. like, do you, do you have any more like hacks for repurposing household items for the classroom? Uh, I am I will repurpose until the cows come home. Okay, I'm from Alabama, so that's the saying we say around here, you're gonna do something until the cows come home, means you're gonna do it for a really long time. So what I did over the summer, I just start kind of pulling things out and see, you know, can I use this for something or do I need to get rid of it? And one of the things that I found were um, my daughter's, my daughter is nine. So she's not really using those like divided food plates anymore, you know, like toddlers would use. She says she's too grown for them. (laughs) My husband said, well, we can just throw them away. No, we're, I'm going to find something to use these for. They were in great condition. So I actually pulled them out and set them aside and came up with some different ways to use them for math lessons and reading lessons. So we've got the the three divided parts at the top with the big section on the bottom. I took some manipulatives. Dry erase marker will write on plastic and erase. So it will write on the plate, wrote out a math problem. In those boxes, you have your manipulatives you can use to demonstrate, you know, two plus three, put them all together to make five. It's the perfect tray for those little hands. So they're not, their manipulatives aren't rolling all over the place and it gives them visuals. It makes it hands on. And those were literally going to go in the garbage. And I took them and now I can use them in my classroom. The online environment has really ramped up, especially since Mm -hmm. the implications of COVID-19 and we've been teaching online and we've been uh, getting really creative on how we interact with students. And so, teaching online, do you have any tips for making your environment feel more like a classroom? So my first and foremost, my biggest piece of advice for your virtual classroom, teach your students how to use the virtual classroom. Mm. You're going to have to teach it explicitly, just like you would your expectations in a physical classroom. You're going to have to teach the same expectations in the virtual classroom. Some students might not know where the mute button is, or they might not have the, know how the chat feature works. You're gonna have to go through each of those modalities and make sure that they understand how it works and how they're able to access the virtual classroom before you can even really start teaching the academics. Because once they're more comfortable in a physical classroom, they're more ready to learn. And the same applies for the virtual classroom. They have to be comfortable in utilizing that virtual setting in order for them to be able to learn. That's so important. The same way we teach routines, procedures, and how to engage like Mm -hmm. in-person is the same uh, mindset we need to have in a virtual environment. It's new routines, new procedures, new buttons. Exactly. And I know we have some reactions where you can, you you can click, raise your hand. You can do a thumbs up emoji, teach those expectations and and procedures. You know, if you agree with the student's answer, give me a thumbs up reaction. If you disagree, give me a thumbs down reaction. Utilize those features so you're not constantly in the chat box, constantly um, being bombarded with student comments because students love to, they love to talk on the yeah. on the computer. Mm-hmm. My daughter, she thought it was the neatest thing ever when she was t- doing her classes online with her teacher and all of the kids wanted to talk to each other. And you have to really work on those procedures for the virtual setting, just like you would for a physical classroom. Absolutely. I think once we uh, establish those, it'll be much more easier to engage because we cannot necessarily use all the tools in our toolbox like we would in a physical classroom in a virtual classroom or online classroom there are a new set of tools a new set of things that we can do to harness the power of being Mm -hmm. able to teach online um so thank you for that do you have any final thoughts as we prepare for back to school my my biggest piece of advice for this is don't feel like you have to have it all ready for that first day You know, like I talked about making that bulletin board that's going to be decorated with student work. Mm -hmm. 
let let the let the kids have some some time to come in and help you decorate a little bit. If you don't have all of the supplies you need, like I mentioned earlier, you got dry erase boards, you got dry erase markers, you're ready to teach. You can make it work. You might not have every single thing you want, but if the necessities are filled, work from there. You can add more as you go on. Like you don't have to spend all your time and all your money over the summer trying to get the perfect Pinterest perfect classroom set up, the Instagram worthy classroom set up. <laughs> It'll come. Your classroom will come and the students will love it just as much, if not more, because they'll have their input in it too. Yeah, student buying is so important and uh it would a great way to to kind of close out um this segment on back to school hacks. Ladies and gentlemen, Rebecca Poe, and I want to just say her bio so you know exactly <laughs> the amazing educator that she is. Uh, Rebecca Poe is an award-winning special education teacher and a national conference presenter. She has over a decade of experience in special education. As an educator, Rebecca believes that all behavior is communication and all feelings are valid. And she focuses on providing equitable education and establishing connections to students of all ability levels in an inclusive setting. Ladies and gentlemen, Rebecca Poe, and you can follow her at Lessons and Lattes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca, for joining us. And I'm incredibly excited to call you my colleague. Thank you so much.